think I've pretty much covered most of what I wanted to say, except that uh, the managers we've worked with have been really great. They recognize where we are, what we have to do, and we're trying not to do things which are going to disrupt their ability to provide essential services to the public. That's your job and our job. And so everything we do is aimed at that. And if you, if you want to call it differently in terms of how we make the cut, we're obviously open to that. But if you add money to the budget, it has to be cut from someplace else. The only option to that would be go back to one-time money, which we would not advocate at this point in time. And uh, I don't know if you're covering the next item here, too, but I think I did speak to the court fee. So if there's any questions, I'd be able to answer that, too. Other than that, I, th I think I've covered it. Ed, we do have a, a, a speaker, but before you go, we do also have members of the board. We'll call on the speaker afterwards. I just want to quickly comment, uh, thank you for doing a great job as always. This has not been an easy five years that we've had to deal with this budget challenge, these budget challenges. And you, along with your staff and everyone in the executive office, but I think most importantly, I mean, under your leadership and in directing and working closely in partnership with all the various department heads, and elected, uh, we wouldn't be where we are back into balance. And we sure as heck wouldn't uh, have have a, a roadmap, if you will, uh, on to recovery without without your leadership. So I want to thank you very, very much. Thanks very much. And as Jay said, we got staff here that are doing yeoman's job. OK, Supervisor Benoit, followed by Supervisor Buster, then Supervisor Ashley. Well, let me. I add my compliments so you take a subject that can make your head spin or soft <laughs> and make it uh, and make it uh, somewhat understandable and, and very much appreciated and, it, and it's understandable both uh, uh, from the numbers basis and also the human toll and the, the cost on our uh, service delivery and every every aspect of it and uh, you do a very good job of that I really appreciate it I wanted to go back, though, to one point that I've made before in our meetings, and I, I want to reemphasize it. Uh, attachment C of the uh, handout that you gave us on page C19 uh, lists the uh, available positions in the county. And the uh, total number of authorized positions in the 12-13 budget, according to this attachment, is 23,445. Uh, the fourth or fifth page of your, of your uh, PowerPoint uh, talks about funded positions in 2012. The number that was on your PowerPoint is 17,801. And the, my math leads me to believe that we got 5,644 positions that are authorized but not funded based on those two handouts. Uh, and I know you made a, a point of bringing that up, and I appreciate it. And I, you made some very good points. In the case of the Sheriff's Department, we know we're going to be opening a new jail. We probably ought to save some positions for that. Uh, DPSS needs some flexibility. But to have 5,644 positions uh, on, uh, authorized, uh, even though they're not budgeted, uh, is a problem for me. I mean, I, I think that we've all been through some very, very difficult times. We've made some very difficult decisions. Uh, and it'd be easy to slip back into some of the things we did before if, if we're not careful. And one of the avenues for that is if the position is still there, it makes it easier mm -hmm. to fill. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I mentioned before, I, I worked in the commissioner's office and did budgeting for the highway patrol, not budgeting, but managed allocations of resources. And one of the things that was a state rule was that if a position was vacant for a year, it, yeah. it came off the budget. Right. It's gone. Uh, I'm not advocating that position because of the things you've said uh, makes some sense, for instance, particularly uh, for the sheriff for trying to get back to patrol or for uh, the uh, 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 other, the DPSS position and so forth. But I, I would think that it, it would behoove us to take a good look at our policy on leaving positions in the budgets uh, or, uh, that are not, not currently budgeted but are authorized and come up with some rational amount that's somewhere short of 5,644 authorized but not budgeted positions. 
And I, I, I really would like to ask the CEO and uh, you to get together and kind of come up with an idea. If I'm making any sense and, it, and it's something we ought to look at, what is a rational policy? You know, 120 percent of your current strength. Uh, maybe that applies to public safety and a little less to some other. But we just shouldn't have almost 6,000 authorized positions. Yeah, I know we've uh, tried to clean this up in the past. Uh, our HR has, and we'll be glad to do that and come back with a plan for you. Yeah, the thing we have in mind, and we've talked about this too, because I know you mentioned this before, and that is uh, we need a, I guess it's an improved position control system so that every job we can identify by number and we know which ones are filled and which ones are vacant by number. And apparently we have some shortfall in that area. Maybe we haven't made the best use of the systems we bought or whatever, but our goal, in fact, uh, Ivan Chan has got that assignment now, come up with a way in which we can have a better handle on, by department, how many jobs are authorized, how many are filled, and then, then we know exactly what to look at each year. These, and maybe get la vacate, vacated as of what date, so that we can electronically focus on where we can start to attack this particular issue because there you know it's only human nature when budgets get cut uh, for some to say take the money but leave the positions I don't want to have to go back in front of that board and ask for jobs and so some of it may be that but I think most of it is the fact that we've got these part-time seasonal and hourly and once we get them out of the picture it may look a little better to you but we we will focus on on that position control system to give you that help. Thank you. Supervisor Buster. All right, thanks for that report, and I, I appreciate your going to some links, and it, it gives us an illustration of what you've gone through, what the county has gone through over the past five or six years. And, uh, you know, uh, Supervisor Benoit correctly brings up, you know, the, the positions are... The extra position is sort of exemplative of the, of the old county. We've changed. We're a whole, we're a whole different creature now. Hopefully, we're a new county. We can, we got a balanced budget for the first time in five years. What a great accomplishment! Even though it's precarious, you're going to be wrestling with this thing for years to come. But at least we can go forward and hopefully upward again. But we're going to have to go in a different fashion. We've been shorn of redevelopment. The state still is a ominous presence, not a helpful one for us. Um, so, uh, new cities, less unincorporated territory, still growing population, uh, uh, still these big business needs, this whole health care reform that really is, uh, all the changes are really, uh, the, the kind of things that are going to happen are going to be emphasized or, or uh, what did uh, Clint say, double down on trickle down? Well, this, this is where the doubling down is going to be on health care right here in the inland area too. So there's all these things going on. So to get to get the county ship shape again with this just basic fundamental thing of do our ongoing revenues um, and, uh, and match our, does our spending match that? And you've done it, you've done it. That is really fundamental. Hopefully, uh, the credit rating agencies, you didn't say, are they taking notice? Are they taking notice? Yeah, well, they lump us in with everyone else at the moment, but yeah. uh, we got a good rate on our last trans, and that's what counts. Uh, they, it's yeah. good to have an outside opinion because it gives you some humility. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it's most important that we, we know ourselves that we're under control, and we'll sell them on the next round, I think. Yeah, and what you've done here, in addition to the more visible, well-publicized uh, reforms with our pension, for example, what you're already doing and the way you're handling the budget, and, I mean, you're mentioning this, but it was too easy to go through with, a, with a, the, the percentage reductions. We've done that and in two or three years of counting and, and a department like Animal Control has really suffered greatly from that. Hopefully, we can shore things, some of these things up. But now you're going beyond that. Now you are beginning to prioritize and look, look for the ways to get internal efficiencies and a restructure management, things that sometimes take several years and you've got to try things and sometimes they don't quite all work out and you've got to readjust. That's what you're doing now. That's really important. And then I would say beyond the momentum that you're starting here, it really carries us to, to tackle what is a, what, and you're mentioning some of the priorities for us. What is the strategic plan that we, this county needs to follow in the next five years? And hopefully, I mean, you've already outlined some of the important things uh, in that category. 
but but I think uh, uh, with the balanced budget now uh, in place, we can begin to address uh, address those issues as well. The county the county is, has always been I think in a leadership position for the last ten or fifteen years. Some of our budgets, um, and a lot of our budgets were real honey. Some of them were cotton candy. We didn't have, we didn't, they were all made out of air. I mean, we didn't have the actual tax base and the economic activity to support some of our budget. But this budget, even though it's a castor oil budget, uh, is a real honest budget, and it, and it, it really tackles uh, the issues that this county uh, needs to do, and I think it sets a good example uh, across the county uh, to all. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ashley, I just wanted to say, uh, way to go, out of boys, out of girls, good job. Uh, particularly, you know, you, you know, the CEO, who did it, he seemed like he's been here forever, and here he's, here he's dealing with this difficult problem. And, and our CEO does, deserves a lot of credit, because he's orchestrating this whole thing. Your CFO, <coughs> fantastic, and you've done a great job. I don't know how you could have done better. You know, to compliment your staff, and particularly all those, the elected department heads, like the sheriff, DA, and all those, uh, you did a wonderful job, and really, Making this work, and then uh, and all the managers have rallied. You can see they're 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 creating. They're coming up with ideas, and that's going to continue on because you've created that climate. You have that climate uh, out there that they're living in that's going to help help push this. And you look at it. We're 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 in still in pretty tough. You know the you know the California as a state. It was like uh, Houston was on in the, the public radio for one of our economists, and he was uh, made a statement like. The state of California is recovering, you know, slowly. And we, the state of California, recovered about 25% of the jobs that were lost during our peak, back to our peak time. But the Inland Empire is uh, not doing uh, quite as well. We're recovering as well, but we recovered less than 15% of the jobs. So we're not doing as well as the state as a whole. So we're, you know, we're going to recover, but it's, we can't expect uh, miracles out there. And I want to say, I'll say, I'm talking about this. Uh, Going back to those June targets, if we hadn't set those June targets, there's no way you'd have come up with this balanced budget right now. Because you, you set you set the targets that are you thought they're realistic, they proved to be, and now as a result we have this balanced budget. And say, well, what's the importance of the budget? What if we missed it by 20 million, 10, 20 million dollars? Say 20 million. Okay, if you if you if you decide, well, we can't do it this year, it's 20 million off. Next year that 20 million becomes 40 million. The third year is 60 million, on it goes. And it just gets harder to do. You have to draw a line somewhere, and the line's been drawn, and, and we'll just have to keep going on that way. Uh, the other uh, thing I want to say is about the rating agencies. The rating agencies are, they're, you know, they're, I'm sure they're impressed by the effort, but they're going to see that if we can actually pull this off this year, which I think we will, and then they're going to be really impressed if we pull it off this year, and then we come up with a balanced budget next year. So that's how we impress the rating agencies, and I think that's uh, going to happen, but it's going to, we're all going to have to work together to make that go. Another uh, thing, I appreciate your comments about the uh, Sheriff's Department, the, uh, so we are trying, you know, we're, we you be careful, we don't want to let our, our public safety, our, our deputy level out in the in inappropriate area go too low, where, you know, we were getting near the tipping scale, and now we want to slowly start building that up and try to get it up near, you know, one per thousand over the next few years. And that's going to be so bad electrician because, you know, you get new deputies are trained, you lose others' retirement, transfer out. So it's just a slow but steady climb, and we're going to have to digest that as we go. Like, we're going to have to digest the first phase of that this year, and then we're going to have to handle the next phase of that next year. But I think we can do it, and it's important we do it for the, for the safety of our of the public. We really need to preserve our public safety. We lose a handle on that, everything else goes down the tubes. So again, thanks, uh, one and all. Uh, there's a lot of hard work went here, and we got a lot of hard work still to do. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. All right, uh, we have heard from my colleagues, so now we have two speakers in the audience. First, our esteemed public defender, Mr. Gary Linden followed by Julie Waltz. Good morning, Mr. 
Mr. Chair, members of the board, J.R., especially J.R. for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning, Ms. Walls, Gary Wyndham, public defender. In 11 days, gentlemen, I will have been your public defender for 13 years. And during that time, we have witnessed economically good times, bad times, and since 2007, we have waded through some of the very ugliest times in Riverside County with regard to economics. The Public Defender's Office has suffered, tightened our belts, lost employees during these very tough times. And when I came before you in June of this year, we demonstrated that any cuts that we would receive would be difficult. But we told you that we would make those cuts, and that million dollar cut we had in June, we are abiding by that position. We laid off three additional people, and we cut our funded positions so that we can meet that 3% cut that we promised in June of 2012. In addition, we agreed to save $2.1 million not because we didn't need the money to operate, but we agreed that we would save $1.4 million so that the building on Main Street would get back on track. We agreed to pay $300,000 for Holt Architect Firm in order for us to be able to proceed with the building on Main Street. In addition to that, we agreed to pay an additional $400,000 to JDP to correct a contract that we entered into and did not feel that uh, we could proceed with because we went over budget prior to the public defender being assigned that particular uh, responsibility. That came up to $2.1. $1.44 million, the money we rolled over, not because we didn't need the money, but because of the obligations that we entered into and we kept. On last Wednesday, we were informed that an additional $3.5 million would be cut from the Capital Defender's Office and the Law Offices of the Public Defender, 1.5 for CDO and $2 million from the Law Offices of the public defender. Make no mistake, gentlemen, I am a team player and have shown you that in the last 13 years. Make no mistake, if this board orders me to make these cuts, it will be done. But the end product will not be the same. These cuts are not cuts, they're amputations. I will have to cut a leg, I will have to cut an arm, or I will have to cut one or, or, or both in order to meet the budget that has been recommended here today. And the reason I'm here is I take issue with the justification for the budget recommendations. I understand, I'm not at the 50,000 foot level that you are looking at the budget, but I am at the 20,000 foot level from my position and I understand the necessity for a balanced budget. But the first rationale for the cuts was a $1.5 million cut from the Capital Defender's Office. We established that office two years ago because over Pacheco's regime, there were about 58 capital defender cases that were filed. We created a system where we would bypass the law offices of the public defender, create a death penalty unit that would be able to handle no more than 20 death penalty cases at three million, almost $4 million. So the structure was only for 20 cases. Currently, we have 19 
death penalty cases in our unit. We have four lawyers handling those matters. And within the last two years, we were able to get out trials within the period of time that we told you we would do it, between 18 months and two years. The classic example is the Green case, the cop killing case, where we were able from beginning to end to have that, ma that case manned, manned and completed without one continuance so that justice could be done at the earliest possible time and justice was done in that case. We have saved substantially in that unit. A $1.5 million cut means a 50% cut in the operations of CDO. We have not had the time in the limited period of time that we were notified Wednesday that we would have to make these cuts. But we will tell you, it means that we would either have to cut that unit because we can't operate, or we would have to substantially reduce the operations. And we have already been informed by the district attorney that if we're not able to continue in the manner in which we have been working closely with the district attorney's office, they would have to be moving to relieve us because of the number of of, of cases that are already in that unit. So this district attorney is averaging somewhere between eight to 10 death penalty cases a year. We expect that there will be four or five more before the end of the year. I understand that there is another one with a, uh, a death of a woman and two children that might go death pretty soon. He's smiling over there, so I think it's going to be 20 in there before I get to my office. The point I'm trying to make is that it was only geared for, for 20. We're already at its max. If we continue to receive the 8 to 10 that will inevitably come, then that unit will be fully operational for the next 10 years if we don't even get any more additional cases. It takes 18 months to two years under our process to do that. Contrary, the private bar has eight death penalty cases out there that's been in existence five to seven years, show you the difference between the time frame and efficiency in our offices. The second rational argument that was given by uh, in support of the recommendations was that the LOPD had a new funding source and that would generate a million dollars. Well, I take issue with that as your subject matter expert. 987.5 of the Penal Code says that the court shall assess up to, not $50, up to $50. And that if there's any challenge about the ability to pay, then that assessment will be held in abeyance until the end of the case and be considered under 987.8 of the Penal Code. And what that means is that whatever funds that are assessed under 987.5 will reduce by the exact same amount, the funds that we receive under 987.8. Now here's how it works. This $50 maximum assessment historically has been somewhere around $25. But this $50 maximum assessment, if you are assessed that fee, then the court will make a determination whether you should pay all or part of it. If you pay any portion of that, then at the end of the case, when they assess attorney's fees, court costs, victim witness, and all the other fees, it will be reduced under 987.8. Further, there is no mechanism presently by the court to accept any fees under 
because it's geared to be picked up at the end. Now, under 987.8, once it gets into that category, the statute says you can't collect from people who go to felons. They are sent to state prison, whether they're housed in the county or whether they're housed in the state. You can't collect from indigent. There will be some monies because since 19, uh, I mean 2009, when the court aggressively started trying to collect under 987.8, we have been receiving 200 to $250,000 a year. That's the maximum. That will be reduced by the amount of money that is paid under 987.5. Where's, where's the net increase? Unless, of course, there are some people who are on the fringes that will fit in the 987.5. And that, in my mind, doesn't equate to a million dollars. The other problem is this. There are four quadrants of payments. Victim witness fees, court fees, probation fees, DA fees, all of those things. There's four quadrants. 987.5 is somewhere in the third quadrant, and 987.8 is in the fourth quadrant, which means that if we were to assess a fee today, we would not receive any funds for two or three years. Yet the cut, the amputation that we're talking about today takes effect today. Now I have talked to the CFO and the CFO understands this issue and said, yes, Gary, if there's a problem, we will work with you on this issue. But you need to know what the problem is when you're making these decisions. Lastly, a, a, a third request of $1 million out of the operation of LOPD because the, the argument is that we want to bring you in line with the sheriff and the DA. We have taken the same cuts. We had the same burdens as the district attorney and the sheriff. The difference is 96% of our incomes come from the general fund. When we get a cut, it is a cut on our operations. Every change, every advantage, every advancement, every effort that we have made in the last 13 years to be the best public defender in the state of California is now in jeopardy. Because when we leave here today with a vote to cut an additional $3.5 million on our budget means an operation that you haven't seen since I came here in 1999. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you, Gary. I don't see any questions. I just want to comment. Uh, you have... Uh, 13 years has gone by quickly, and there are two of us up here that, uh, that we're not that old. We remember uh, your predecessors and the challenges we had in the Public Defender's Office. I'm sure everybody else does it. Had to work with the uh, prior uh, Public Defender's Office. I can see why you were a good lawyer when you were practicing. You make some very compelling arguments, and I appreciate them very much, and uh, that uh, sure will it uh, gives me uh, a need to want to ask further questions and we get to final deliberation here today. So thank you thank for you. your very compelling arguments. Uh, Julie Waltz. Good morning. Um, I would just like to say in regards to the uh, statement that Supervisor Renoid made about the job classifications of the Sheriff's Department, about taking those jobs away or putting them on hold or something to that effect. I just want to say the Sheriff's Department gave back almost $7 million and the, the 
district attorney's office gave back money to why should those positions have to be deleted in the event that they need to play somebody in that position they're going to have to come to the board every single time as a constituent of this county i'm going to tell you something we law enforcement is very very important and until you've had to call for a deputy to come into your neighborhood you don't understand the effects. I mean, when I call for a deputy, I want a deputy there right now. I don't want to have to wait 45 minutes. Somebody could be injured or hurt or anything could happen. Never, we, I don't think you should do that. That's my opinion. I, I reconsider that because they do give the money back. They've done it for the past two years that I know of and probably even longer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Okay, that concludes our speakers on item 3.6, excuse me, 3.59 and 3.60. Uh, are there any comments by members of the board? I see no comments by members of the boards. Mr. Oh. Wolf, Supervisor Benoit. Yep, Mr. Speaker, I, I am uh, concerned about the disparity between the comments uh, from the the CFO and uh, the public defender, and, and I'd like to hear some response from the CFO or CEO uh, about how we resolve that. I, I don't know that I can resolve it in my mind without some further input. Well, let me just make a couple of overarching comments. Uh, Chris Hans is here with data if we want to go through the data on the thing. But uh, the, the first thing I heard, and I, we don't want to get into a back and forth over this thing, right? But first thing I heard was that uh, Mr. Wyndham heard from us last Wednesday about making the cut. The fact is that at least a couple of months ago, we sat with him for the first time and we said, based upon our data, this is what looks like we should consider as far as additional cuts. And then there was supposed to be a lot of back and forth time in terms of let's reconcile so we can get to yes or no and get a firm answer. So there was plenty of time. It was not a last minute. The implication is a last minute word after a decision. That was not the case. Secondly, I, I don't disagree with some of his comments as far as caseload like on the capital cases. When we sat to talk about caseload, we would have appreciated hearing the opposition uh, in terms of why that wasn't a good idea. Uh, the caseload data we saw certainly justified the reduction we have suggested. Um, as to the, f the court fee, there was a lot of time spent on the court fee. We've already said we will make up for that. If we have the money, we will provide the money if he doesn't get it. So he does not have to take a cut for that million dollars. Uh, lastly, I'm not sure I heard this exactly right, but he mentioned that he was ready, uh, assuming that in this year's budget he would save $1.3 million towards the continuing increase in the cost of his new building. Well, we have already decided we're not going to use his money for that. We're going to debt finance the entire thing. So I would think that means there's a $1.3 million savings there. I may be wrong. Mr. Hans can talk about it. But, um, and the fee on the, on the court, that's an estimate from the courts. So we took that in good faith and obviously we'll make it good. So it's, you're talking about what is the caseload. As for the cuts, the last item, we looked at the cuts over the last couple of years. If you recall last year, the DA and the sheriff, I believe both took a 3% reduction on top of their de facto cuts from the prior year. I believe you recall getting a letter from uh, Mr. Wyndham, who was unable to make those hearings, asking that his budget not be cut. And I think the net of that was he took about a $500,000 cut. As a result, at this point for this year, um, sheriff and DA are down by about 7.8% as far as their operations. And we simply sought to reduce his law offices of the public defender to about that same percentage. So we were looking for a matter of equity. Now, if he's disputing that, we, we can spend more time on it, but that's, that's the facts as we understood them, and that's why we presented the recommendations we did. And if you want more data, we can go through that. I've heard enough. Okay, thanks, Ed. Uh, Supervisor Ashley. I've heard enough. I'm ready to approve the budget as presented, and I also added 3.59 and item 3.60. 
Okay. Um, any comments of your guys, Investor? No? Okay. I, uh, is that a motion, Supervisor Ashley? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, second Supervisor Ashley's motion with the understanding that um, we ask uh, the Executive Officer to sit down with, uh, to, on two items that I'm concerned about. And Supervisor Ashley, if you'd like to, if, if you concur with this. I'll include that. But I think they explained it pretty well, but there's still, you know, I still think this discussion should take place that should have taken place before. And I, you know, I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm, right now I'm citing on the CEO and the CFO on this one. I think uh, the budget will, will work, but I, I think he it's, should sit down and explain uh, those numbers with him so he'll understand the reasoning they came behind the budget. That should have happened before. Okay. No, pointing fingers, but then I think I'm, I'm ready to go with, with a balanced budget. I am not going to change the budget, even if that but that argument is compelling. I'm going to have a balanced budget. Okay, I'm going I'm to ask uh, then, just to, if, if you'll include that, and I'll concur with as a second, to just have a discussion between the CEO and, and uh, and uh, our public defender on that issue with, uh, to address Gary's concerns. I know the CEO, I know that Gary, our public defender, will do their best to try to work this out if there is a, if there is a workable solution. And secondly, uh, to have the ultimate goal in mind, and I think everyone already concurs, because I think we've said it at prior board meetings, to at, at some point in time in the very near future, get ourselves in the, to work the process to get ourselves up to 1.0. Uh, within the sheriff's department in the unincorporated areas, I think that's already been through discussions. Correct, Jay? Uh, yes. Communication is going to continue with uh, all our department heads: uh, public defender, sheriff, district attorney. Um, we are enhancing communication. We continue to communicate, and we're going to continue to communicate with the board on where we're at in the budget. As you know, as we always have, we have quarterly reports coming back, so you'll receive further updates. And yes, we will be communicating with all department heads. All right. With those clarifications to the motion, we have a motion and a second. Items 3.59 and 3.60, both of those items. Please vote. Supervisor. Supervisor, we stepped out. <laughs> so uh, we have, uh, we need a four-fifths on that, don't we? No, no. Four-fifths to change it. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So item passes 3-0. There he is. Four. Going once. <laughs> okay. Our, our item passes unanimously. Now taking us item 3.61. Gary. Gary Grant. One will... No, I don't have a comment okay. on 3.61. So in that case, uh, thank you very much. I'll entertain a motion for approval by item 3.61. Uh, 61. And also, uh, just as a side comment, we talked about wildfire Please suppression. Mm -hmm. uh, and just talked about this a moment. You know, we're going to be able to, it looks like we're going to be getting the big planes. And those big planes, no way we're ever going to be able to land at Ryan Field. Mm -hmm. We better start making provision to where those land, like maybe Marchfield, which I thought was the best choice to start with. And things looking better every day now. I agreed with that. Okay. Then. So, uh, but we have it, and yeah, we do have, uh, you know, aviation and civilian fuel available out there. We got the longest airport in the East Coast. I think those 
got to figure some way or another where those planes can use that whenever they have to be deployed here. So the planes that are in the, in the subject of this motion, are they no, too they, large to go ahead? They, they, well, they could be those big, large. They're talking about getting those big 747s. I know the 747 can't possibly, but I'm not sure about these. I'm just yeah, curious. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, some yeah. of these bigger planes are looking at, they can't land at Ryan Field. I agree with you 100%. Okay. Yep. But uh, notwithstanding that, I think we have to try and get the planes first, and then we'll figure right, it let's, out. Let's, let's get this done, and then the, yeah. you got to start thinking about that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second for that. Uh, all in favor, please vote. Motion passes. We have speakers on items 3.64. First, I'm going to call on Janetta Giavinko, followed by Sam Davis, who will be followed by Paul Jacobs. Thank you very much. Good morning, Honorable Chairman and members of the Board of Supervisors. I'll be very brief. I'm here on behalf of the City of Temecula. We have submitted a letter um, by the city attorney, Peter Thorson, which I believe was distributed by email last night, and I've also provided hard copies okay. this morning. Just like to first state that the city of Temecula supports the effort of the Board of Supervisors to generate jobs within Riverside County. We would also like to confirm what is our understanding that the current item before the board does not pertain to either surface mining permits or Liberty Quarry, and that any effort to apply any revisions to the fast track policy uh, to the surface mining permits, to surface mining permits or to Liberty Quarry specifically uh, could not occur unless and until county ordinance numbers 348 and 555 are duly amended. And then finally, we'd like to again renew our objections to the placement of surface mines in Liberty Quarry into the fast track policy. But if my first assumption is correct, we obviously will be back to speak to that at an appropriate time as well. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll let council respond, but this, this is not related to the Liberty Quarry. This is related to uh, complete issues related to fast track of commercial projects um, that are going to create jobs for veterans and those that are of preference to unemployed, currently unemployed, and veterans. That is true. Uh, this is only, this is not impacting Liberty Quarry as uh, council has um, confirmed and the chairman has confirmed. Right. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next speaker is um, Sam Davis. Sam will be followed by Paul Jacobs. Hello, Dr. Davis. Good to see you. Thank you, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Sam Davis. I'm a board member for RCC. I'm a trustee member. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to talk about the veterans. But before I get to that point, let me tell you that our Tigers, RCC football team, is ranked number seven in the nation. Now, there are 110 community college districts in California. I don't know how many community college districts there are across America, but I think it's phenomenal. Our football team is ranked number seven in the, in the nation. That's, that's quite a feat, and uh, uh, goes along with the celebration of last week where we had uh, at RCC, Tyler Clary, one, another one of our local athletes, That's athletes right. honored for a gold medalist. That's right. And by the way, um, Santiago High School in Corona, their band was just honored. It will be. They were chosen to be in the the lead band in the in the 2000, 2013 Rose Parade. That's so great. Good That's th great. good things for Riverside County kids and good students. Things. But um, to continue, less than 10% of the um, people in uniform are, any, less than 10% of the people in the nation of, of America are in uniform. 
yet more than 40% of the veterans are homeless. And with the returning veterans coming from Iraq and Afghanistan, we've seen an increasing number of unemployed veterans. I have beside me Les, um, who's a contractor who's making a sincere effort to employ veterans. I'd like to introduce Les to the board. Great. Hi, Les. Hello, and how are you guys doing today? Fine, thank you. My name is Les Campbell and with Campbell Construction, and what we are doing is we are hiring the veterans from U.S. vets who came home from Iraq and Afghanistan um, to this economy and couldn't find work. Uh, we're employing them in green energy technologies and using the various rebate programs offered through the states and utility companies to do this. <clears throat> By using these programs, we, <clears throat> we can provide these services for free for the customers while employing these veterans at the same time. Um, I would like to get on your guys' approved vendors list to, uh, to obtain more work for, for our veterans and to see what it would take for Campbell Construction to provide this free green energy services to entire, to entire cities using these rebate programs. We can provide the services for free and save the cities tens of thousands of dollars a year to put where you guys deem necessary and in the process we're going to be able to put a lot of people to work, namely these veterans, by doing this and so I see it as a win-win solution. Well thank you Les, appreciate your comments. Uh, this, again this is an item that we hope will uh, incentivize those that are, are, are wanting to bring new projects into our county. Unrelated to surface mining, this is not covered under the surface mining uh, uh, concern. This is just a, this is an amendment to our existing fast track policy that will give preference to veterans, most importantly returning veterans, and currently unemployed uh, or those that have been under the unemployment rolls for for an extended period of time, and also local companies. Recognizing that sometimes it's difficult to do under public code in every single case, but uh, with that, uh, appreciate your comments, Dr. Davis, and Les. So who, who should you turn to as a contact person? Uh, if you will contact my office upstairs, talk to John Field, we'll put you in touch with the right person on how to get on a preferred list, or not a preferred list, but just get on a selected vendor's list. Very well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, Supervisor Pinoy, you had some comments. You want to go after this? Sure. Yes. Mark, you want to go after all the speakers? Yeah. Okay. Let's oh, yeah. wait. We have we have more speakers. Um, Marel, I, I believe it's Dorsey. Is that correct, Marel Dorsey? Sorry, to your left, or to your right, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Said, uh, good morning, supervisors and chairman. Uh, I was slightly mistaken by the fast track, what you were after, but I'd like to just address, the, in, in general, the types of businesses that you would consider. And uh, with, the, with the fact that uh, you did a lovely presentation for uh, September 11th today and of course we're all reminded about how short life is uh, that we want to leave behind good things for those who follow us uh, I was a teacher you have seen me in front of you uh, uh, representing uh, uh, the Temecula Valley uh, real estate agents and other other real estate agents that have joined us uh, against Liberty Quarry so, you know, you know, and you know, we've been fighting a very long time, since 2005, to try to leave something good behind. What I did want to share with you is that uh, it's something that came up with 9-11, which is the air quality. Because we know that with the best of intentions, uh, people made mistakes about having proper, um, you know, equipment. And a lot of people are suffering that helped uh, at 9-11. They're still suffering. I think there's quite a bit of cancer cases. And uh, you know, I don't think this was done in any mean way. 
but a lot of people's lives are being hurt. And uh, so that brings up this, uh, I don't think any of you really want to do anything bad to people that follow. And um, the American Lung Association, you, I know you had a letter from them, and I just want to give you a little background on that. It was Granite, uh, the Granite Construction Company that first contacted the American Lung Association to take a look at what they, they presented their case. They went to the board meeting and they presented their case that they would make better air quality in Riverside County with less trucks, that whole argument. And we came along six months later and just asked them to just please look at the EIR because our experts and at layman reading it really uh, came to believe that it was really bad. That it was, it, a layman could read that the studies were done very poorly and that uh, like some of the pollutants for the stationary plant were seven times what was recommended and they had to buy all kinds of uh, credits. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Dorsey, your time's up. I, I think we understand your concern, but this, again, this is, this is not, this item is not related to surplus mining permits. Well, okay. and in fact, it's encouraging projects that uh, are LEEDS approved, meaning the environmental, all the environmental uh, building products that go into the product. Uh, and uh, clean energy and otherwise. At the same time, put a giving preference to uh, local contractors and veterans. I, I just don't think that the quarry should be one of those projects. Think, Thank I you. I think we made that very clear that that's not uh, part of this policy. All right, Fred Bartz. Fred, um, you have six minutes. Three given by Marianne Byers. Morning. I think, yes. Mr. So Chairman, uh, fellow supervisors, my name is Fred Bartz. Uh, first of all, I want to start out by applauding the effort of the uh, Chairman Tavaloni to bring forward any effort that brings real full-time jobs. I understand the need for jobs for construction workers and for certainly our veterans. I'm involved in a group in San Diego County uh, which deals with some of the issues down there and it's a very sad situation with our returning veterans attempting to make this transition from uh, warriors to now uh, meaningful workers. Also, as the head of a homeowner association to make it with, with 845 homes, I see every home foreclosure documents before they happen. And I'm actually finding some of these now are actually happening to some of our veterans who came here, moved back, got out of the military, hoping to find a job in Riverside County, and now are having to lose their home and prop with it. I only ask that we make sure that these are real jobs. I have seen some of the activities in other parts, not in the county, but in the cities of Riverside, where in our city, excuse me, cities within Riverside County, rather, not the city of Riverside, where the estimate for jobs have been very significant, uh, talking about so many jobs per thousand square feet, only to find, one, the jobs are coming from outside or from other areas. So I also let, ask that when you review these projects going forward that there will be some, we'll call it policing, that this happens. I think the biggest reason I'm here today is when I looked at the document that came out, actually I was very pleased with it because it was, to me, very simple. But it talked in the document that was put out on the agenda about preferencing jobs. And if you haven't seen today's um, Press Enterprise, there's an article that says that the county would be requiring these jobs. And I think that's where some of the confusion has started. And when you read further in the article, yes, by the way, the reporter has brought up the subject of Liberty Quarry. Um, I don't see the connection, but uh, I think that's the problem with, with the media. And I would hope, to have Supervisor Tavaloni, that uh, you would maybe clarify that, as you've already said, that this is about preferencing jobs and about bringing more jobs to the county. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Fred. Yes, it's exactly what it's for. I wish I could control everything the press writes, but I can't. <laughs> um, but it, as a matter of fact, this is this is strictly, I'll, I'll state again, this has nothing to do with Liberty Quarry or, <coughs> or CERC responding permits. This has solely to do with uh, amending the fast track policy to give preference to veterans uh, those that are currently, and not only just veterans, but those that are currently non-veterans but have been on the unemployment rolls uh, and encouraging local companies to hire those individuals uh, as part of the fast track process. Okay, um, Rebecca Ludwig.
Good morning, Council. My name is Rebecca Ludwig, and I oppose any form of fast tracking, and here's why. In my opinion, and the way I understand it and how I've seen it work, it eliminates a proper cross-checking of said projects. It will eliminate public participation, making it more difficult in holding responsible parties accountable should they not abide by the rules. It will not allow proper transparency to the public, us, the taxpayers. It eliminates the proper bidding process and or selection of its bidders for projects. And the key word here is whenever possible. You can't even be specific as to where the EDA fast tracking meetings are going to be held. At the Board of Supervisors meeting on August 28, I questioned agenda item 3.34 and why the EDA obtained 33 fir firms and what projects would be involved. Well, supervisors, today it became clear that you knew all along. The seven pages to the agenda item 3.64 states daycare centers, health start centers, and child development centers, commercial and or industrial development, residential development, and renewable energy projects. The only plus here is that the developer is required to hire veterans who will be, who have been unemployed for six or more months due to economic conditions. The downside is that the supervisors and EDA have not always been truthful with the public about previous projects. Even the city of Yoruba Valley rejected many of the county slash EDA projects. This is only one of many reasons the RDA has been eliminated by Sacramento and has always denied any request by the county slash EDA's request for reconsideration to continue on many projects. The county also has a record for showing favoritism on many projects to certain firms. In closing, I know that all of you will pass this agenda item like you always do, and many individuals are aware of your favoritism with who you choose to work with on your projects. And Supervisor Tavaloni, with all due respect, you have tried so hard to discredit me every time I try to hold you accountable and bring awareness of serious problems in District 2 and in Riverside. So let me reiterate once again that I am only the messenger and the people are paying attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And let me just comment. Uh, I do not intend to try to discredit anyone. I just try to correct when the information is inaccurate and your information today is inaccurate. You had mentioned that, uh, that uh, there will not be bidding on these projects. First and foremost, these are not public projects that are covered under this fast track policy. I understand that. These are private projects in which whoever uh, qualifies for the fast track project will be responsible for their own bidding and their own cost. Uh, they will just have to adhere to certain policy in order to That's what I was fast referring track. to, excuse me, that's what I was referring to here on agenda item 3.34 on the last meeting where it had Okay, well, then we're talking about 3.64 today, not 3.34. Yes, okay. but I believe they're both connected, and that's why you streamlined Absolutely. these, no? no? No, they're not. Okay, then I stand corrected on that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is uh, Bob Frost, Robert Frost. Mr. Chairman? County Supervisors. My name is Bob Frost. I live in Riverside. Um, this fast tracking, we have been over the years fighting for projects for five years now. I can say that on January 1, we finally started our first project that put about, about 150 guys to work, and they're still out there working on those projects. I work with the electricians. We finally got the uh, first solar project started uh, at a desert center. 
I can say to date we have 400 electricians out there that are starting to regain their homes, their families, and their livelihood back to where when they came to our picnic on Saturday, we had 900 people show up and they were thrilled about the progress that is taking place in our county. And that comes from several plane flights to fight for these projects with you in partnership and we continue to fight for those projects. This fast tracking can only help the county grow. We need to bring stimulus back to the county. We need to put these projects back on track. We can no longer deal with five year delays on projects. We need to get this going. And to put the veterans to work, the Helmets to Hard Hats program through the building trades in Riverside County have been a large uh, influx of good quality workers for every one of our trades. Matter of fact, for the last five years, our top graduating students have been through the Helmets to Hard Hats program. So we appreciate that. If you are available, we're doing a job fair in Indio on the 13th. Um, it's a very important issue, and the veterans um, are putting on a program in October that we'll be out there working on, and we appreciate all your assistance on helping us get the veterans out there and get them back working in society. And the difference is, is we give them a career pathway, not just a job. So thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Bob. appreciate you coming today. Um, and I also want to just compliment you on the, uh, the laborers' um, Helmets to hard hats. I, that's just a, a tremendous program, and we appreciate that you, that you structure that and put that forward. Because for those that, that don't know, this is taking better, returning veterans and, and retraining them and putting them to work in some type of uh, construction labor trade. And I think I just want before I go to Supervisor Miller, because I know he has some comments. I want to add to something that uh, Fred Bartz mentioned. Uh, you know. The, the, not only are we dealing with, because of five years, uh, more, longer than five years of an economic downturn, are we dealing with a number of veterans that are returning and finding themselves unemployed uh, for extended period of time? So then what Fred mentioned uh, in his homeowners association, where you have these veterans, not, so they're unemployed, and then they find themselves out of, uh, are going into default on their homes. And, and that's just very, very unfortunate. Um, but that's, that's just the way it is on for, uh, right now, and we need to do what we can to try to help them. Supervisor Benoit, followed by Supervisor Ashley. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Tavaloni and Chairman, for bringing this item forward. I think it's a, uh, an appropriate and a positive step, particularly having to do with our veterans or long-term unemployed in the uh, green products area, anything we can do to move through the process, mindful that we have to meet all the minimum legal requirements and, and there, the fast track does not mean no public uh, input or no uh, opportunity for comment. It absolutely does require that still and, and in some cases it would be here in front of the board instead of other places, but it's, it's still available for that. Uh, so I, I want to say I full, full heartedly support your, your uh, initiative with one uh, concern. And that is, uh, we have a kind of a duplication here when item number five, and it's not explained in detail, but it says renewable energy projects, they are already covered under uh, County Ordinance 348 for fast track to some degree. And we do have litigation as a result of our B29 policy. So I think it might be confusing and a problem to include that one item. Uh, I would love to move approval uh, with the exception of striking five and renumbering as necessary for the six and seven to be moved up. Uh, because I think everything else in here is absolutely appropriate, but I would worry about the confusion and potential impacts it might have on our legal process if we were to include item number five on this particular motion. Thank you, Supervisor. We're not all second your motion. I would like clarification on your concern on the replication. Um, Excuse me, um, Chairman and uh, Supervisor Benoit. We do have, uh, this is a policy. We could have it included in the uh, ordinance and also reflected on the policy, that would not be inconsistent. And either way, it still has to come back before, each project has to come back before the Board of Supervisors. Right. For up or down fast track approval. 
So what's, what's your recommendation? I, mean, I would just recommend to, just to leave, leave, it, leave it in. Um, it's in the policy. It's also in the ordinance. We're going to be coming back, I believe, with ordinances amendments on 555 at a later time. And 348. Um, right, 348. It's uh, consistent to go ahead and have it in the policy and the ordinance. Okay, I was under the impression that there were concerns from county council with regard to that. If they're not, I would move approval of the item as proposed. Second, your motion. But just to clarify, you mentioned 555, and that's surface mining. This is not part of 555. This is not 555. I want to make, make that perfectly clear. Uh, and then also, before I go to Supervisor Ashley, I want to uh, make sure to m mention in the record that we did receive a letter uh, of concern from uh, Chairman McCarl of the Pechanga Indian Reservation uh, expressing his concern, but primarily related to uh, Liberty Quarry issues and, um, and uh, the, the, the concerns of, of addressing uh, through CEQA uh, uh, tribal lands and sacred, sacred lands. Okay. So that will be submitted okay. to the record. Supervisor Ashley. Thank you. Again, I want to applaud you for bringing this forward. You know, this is a, particularly you look at those job statistics where we're lagging the state of California and creating jobs. This will help us speed up some projects and get jobs to us faster. And also it helps vets, helps local companies get the work. If we had too many of these projects we proved, and then suddenly here's some contractor from Long Beach or somewhere out doing the work, bringing their workers out. And it's, it'd be better to make the effort here as we have a lot of unemployed people here that have the skills. I think another important thing is this is addressing the process and making the process uh, leaner and cleaner uh, for, for that regard you know, to uh, you know, the, is coming directly to the board and eventually we have to approve everything anyway so we are the decision maker. But what this is, is doing, I think it's addressing uh, something that the whole state and we all have to overcome and I call it the California disease or the overregulation and the perceived overregulation. Some of the regulation is good. We want all want clean air, clean water, and so forth. So uh, I think this is really good, and I strongly support it. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Ashley. All right, we do have um, any others wishing to speak on item uh, 3.64. Before we go to a vote, I know Council would like to make one minor correction of a paragraph yes. number. Thank you. On uh, page 3, uh, under authorization, before the board votes on this, I'd just like to reflect an additional revision. The paragraph reference should not be five, it should be seven. Thank you. Okay. With that, we have a motion and a second. 3.64, please vote. Motion is unanimous. That concludes our policy calendar. Now we go into our 9.30 a.m. public, public hearings at 10 after 12. And um, first, we have uh, our county council code enforcement.